this is Kathy Cassidy and I'm here to read you another chapter of Scarlet and as you'll know if you've been following it the story has just really got to a very exciting bit and I hope that you're going to enjoy this chapter it's actually chapter 30 and that means that there's only two chapters left after this so yeah we're really really kind of racing towards the end I had a couple of shout outs to do today. Um, one of them um, is to, we, ha we had a little conversation and people were leaving comments on the YouTube channel. And one of the comments was from Hilary, an artist. Um, I'd asked whether people watch episode by episode or chapter by chapter or whether they do a little binge watch. And Hilary is um, an artist friend who listens while she paints and she'll listen to several chapters all together and I love imagining that, that's great. Um, and then there is Shelley and Delilah and Joey who listen every day except if Delilah and Joey are at their dad's house and then when they get back they will binge to kind of catch up. And Francesca who listens almost every day with a coffee and says it's a little bit like meeting up with a friend who loves books as much as you do, which I loved. Um, and she also loves the comments on the YouTube channel because she thinks it gives a real book club vibe and I really agree about that. I absolutely love the little bits of chat and banter on the YouTube um, channel. Shout outs to Jessie who I'm, and, and Mel as well who are both binge listening and to Nikki whose family um, are really enjoying, Nikki says, and to my fantastic um, friend Melanie who has been driving cancer patients um, to and from their hospital appointments during the lockdown. And if that is not heroic enough, Melanie, um, uh, maybe about two weeks ago, I think, 10 days, two weeks ago, she shaved her head for charity. She'd managed to get sponsored to do a head shave and has raised a huge amount of money for um, a local cancer charity, which I think is amazing. She had beautiful long blonde hair and now she is even cooler because she's wearing her kindness. So uh, well done, Melanie. Um, and that I think is, is the shout outs for today. Um, apologies if you if you want a shout out you really better you know leave a comment on YouTube and ask because otherwise I'm going to miss you because we are only only two chapters really now from the end but here we go with chapter 30. It's past midnight. Holly is asleep on a squashy blue vinyl chair beside me her head resting on my shoulder. One of her mouse brown plaits curls down around my arm like a snake. Claire is sleeping in the maternity ward just along the corridor and Dad is keeping his own night vigil in the special care baby unit nearby. My new little sister lies in an incubator, a tiny angry doll. She looks like she could break at any minute. She's hooked up to tubes and drips and ventilators and when I saw her I raked the dent in my tongue against my teeth and blinked back tears. I wanted to rip out the tubes and wires, lift her up and hold her tight but I knew I couldn't. I left Dad sitting with his face against the incubator, his hand against inside one of the portholes, one curled finger resting against the baby's clenched fist while the doctors and nurses moved silently around him. Ed and Sylvie went hours ago, back to the real world. They left me with a scribbled address somewhere in Ohio and promises that everything was going to be fine and that we were to keep in touch and come visit someday, the whole family, baby included. I shift around on my seat, letting Holly's head slip down towards my lap. She moans a little, pulls an arm across her eyes to block out the light. The minute hand on the wall clock jerks around in slow motion. Scarlet, a voice says. I turn, expecting to see the kind-faced nurse who bought me a hot chocolate earlier on. But the figure in the corridor is not a nurse. She's small and slim with blonde hair piled up in a messy bun and a blue skirt suit and impossibly high-heeled, pointy shoes. She looks tired and creased and slightly uncertain, standing there in the half-light. 
Mum, I say. Mum, what are you doing here? Mum hugs me so tightly, it feels like she's holding me together. When someone holds you that tight, it feels safe. Safe enough to let yourself fall to pieces. The tears come again. Tears for Claire and Dad and my new baby sister, wired up to monitors and machines and feeding tubes in the bright warm room along the corridor. Tears for myself and the mess I've made of things. Scarlet, Mum whispers into my hair. It's all right. It's all right. When I'm done with crying, she wipes my eyes and strokes my cheeks and I become aware of Holly staring at us wide-eyed from the blue vinyl seats. It's okay, I tell her. It's okay, Holes, really. This is my mum. Hi, Holly, mum says to her politely, offering a hand to shake. I'm pleased to meet you at last. Let's find Chris, shall we? Mum takes charge. She tells Dad and Holly that... She tells Dad that Holly and I are exhausted and offers to take us back to the cottage to get us some sleep. I'll bring them back in the morning when they've had some rest and some breakfast and a change of clothes, she says. They can't stay here all night. I'm not leaving Claire, Dad says defensively. I'm not going anywhere until I know the baby's going to be okay. Of course not, Mum says. You're needed here. I'll take the girls. I've got a hire car and Scarlet can show me the way. Ring me in the morning. Let me know what's happening. The phone at the cottage is broken, I remember. Mum shrugs. Well, you've got my mobile number, Chris. Call me first thing. I will, Dad says. Thanks. No problem, Mum says. Come on, girls. We drive through the night in Mum's hire car. Holly fast asleep on the back seat. Me, wide awake, wired. Fear running through me. I can't stop thinking about my new baby sister, tiny, frail and raw, not quite ready for the world. I wish I'd found a way to tell her to hang on, to give it a chance. The drive back takes forever because we don't have a map and the signposts are kind of crazy, but finally we get to Killymore and I know the way from there well enough. Mum lifts Holly out of the car and scoops her up, brown legs dangling, to carry her in. The chickens rustle anxiously from the branches of the apple tree because nobody was around to shut them in the hen house. The front door is unlocked, the lights blazing. The power cut is clearly over. Apart from that, the cottage is just the way we left it. The kitchen table heaped with fabric, the stepladder still propped up into the open attic hatch as we edge carefully past to Holly's room. I pull the pink quilt back and Mum lowers Holly down gently, easing off her shoes, tucking the cover up around her chin. I drop a kiss onto her forehead and see the look of surprise flicker across Mum's face. I draw the curtains and switch off the light as we leave the room. Out on the landing, Mum folds the ladder and pulls the hatch closed while I gather up the little dresses still scattered across the floorboards. If Mum recognises them, she doesn't say so. She carries the stepladder downstairs, finds the back porch and props it inside, puts the kettle on, sweeps the mounds of scrap fabric off the table and into Claire's scrap bag. I catch the corner of the cock quilt and rescue it, spreading the patchwork out across the table. Claire was making a cock quilt, I tell Mum. She never finished it. Mum strokes a hand across the quilt, smoothing the surface, tracing the pattern of bright stitching that decorates each jigsaw join. Plenty of time for that, she says softly. We can take it into the hospital tomorrow. Claire can work on it there if she's feeling up to it. Or maybe we could do a little bit. Could we? I ask. I'd like that, Mum. Thanks. OK, sweetheart. Mum smiles. No problem, but right now you need to sleep. Bed, Scarlet, and don't worry, it will all look a lot better in the morning. I pause halfway up the stairs, looking down. Mum, you must have caught the first plane out here after I spoke to you this afternoon. 
Ah, she says, smiling. Alima made the reservations over the phone. There were no late flights to knock, but we found one going from Luton to Galway, and I took a taxi to the airport. The flight was on time, so it was just a case of hiring a car once I got there. What will your boss say? I ask. Couldn't care less, Mum says. I work long enough hours for that firm. They don't own me. I raise an eyebrow. Mum, what exactly made you decide to come? She looks up, smiling. Easy, she tells me. You needed me, Scarlet. Simple as that. So there you go. There's chapter 30 of Scarlet. And uh, the end is, yeah, we're closing in on the end quite quickly now. Thank you so much for all your gorgeous comments and questions and everything on the YouTube channel. Um, if you know anybody who might enjoy this story, don't forget to tell them, to let them know, maybe send them a link because all of the chapters are available there. They can binge watch and ch just go straight the way through from chapter one. Um, and if you would like me to do a, a little YouTube video answering questions, which Eve asked me to do, please leave your questions on the YouTube channel if you can, um, because I will definitely see it there. And yeah, it would, it would be nice. It might be nice to do one last video and uh, answer lots of your nosy questions. That would be cool. Meanwhile, please take care. Stay home, stay safe, keep smiling and just keep on being awesome. See you tomorrow.